Hello my lovely little pheasants, welcome back. So today, I'm going to do a requested video, a long requested video. This is probably the most highly requested video I've ever received for one particular movie, ever. Um, so I'm here to deliver because who is a queen if she does not listen to her people? Yes, today we're going to be talking about Marie Antoinette, the 2006 film directed by Sofia Coppola and starring none other than Kirsten Dunst. So let's shimmy onto it after this commercial break. Are your eyes tired of reading? Do you feel like you don't have the time to pick up a book? Are you an auditory learner? If you answered yes to any of those questions, then try Audible. Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment. If you join Audible, you'll get full access to the popular Plus catalog that has thousands of selections, as well as one credit every month good for any title in the premium selection. My name is Mina and I downloaded Audible last week. My job requires me to read tons of research papers and textbooks every single day. And sometimes I just want a break. I wear contact lenses, my eyes get dry. So I downloaded Audible. What am I listening to, you ask? Marie Antoinette, The Journey by Antonia Frazier. This is the book that Sofia Coppola took the most references from when she did her movie Marie Antoinette, so I wanted to dive into it to learn more about Marie's actual life and see what Sofia Coppola decided to adapt. If you want to try out Audible, go to audible.com slash Mina or text Mina to 500-500. As a refresher, Marie Antoinette is a historical drama based on the life of Marie Antoinette, the infamous queen of France who was beheaded by the revolution. The time period it covers is from 1770, starting with her marriage to Louis XVI, to 1789, the year that the royal family had to leave Versailles. The reason I love this movie is because it's such a good case of historical anachronism. Um, for one, I love the movie soundtrack. This is probably one of my favorite movie soundtracks of all time. combined with the costumes perfectly capture how Marie came to Versailles as a teenager and how she had no idea what she was doing, which is why she was overspending and building this awful public image of herself. Your Majesty, you have spent over 50,000 already this month. There is nothing left to give to your charities. Oh. And you know, on top of that, the cinematography is great. I do like Sofia Coppola's directing too, despite her very homogenous casting choices. Actually, can I have five more of these little blonde bitches? The costume designer for this movie is Melina Cananero, and she actually won her third Oscar for this movie. Um, she's done other movies like 2001 A Space Odyssey, Barry Lyndon, Grand Budapest Hotel. Great portfolio. According to the London Times Magazine, before the start of production, Coppola actually approached Cananero with a box of macaroons from the Latteray pastry shop as to give her an idea of what she wanted the color palette for the costumes to be. For Marie Antoinette, Cananero created about 170 costumes, 100 of them which were made for Kirsten Dunst specifically. The shoes were also created by Manolo Blahnik. And you're Manolo Blahniks. What? No! Give me a fucking Blonix! Cananero said in an interview with the Times that for Marie Antoinette, she wanted to simplify the very heavy look of the 18th century. She wanted it to be believable, but more stylized. KK Barrett, the production designer, also said in an interview with the LA Times, I think what we did in general was that we freshened the whole palette of the French vision of the world at that time to a more of a pastel vision. We didn't want to get into the darker, somber colors that Sophia calls the jewel tones. We relegated those to the older king. We decided to make sure to overemphasize the fact that she was 14 when she first got there and to make it seem like a fresh new world rather than old and dowdy. According to Coppola herself, she was trying to make the movie seem normal versus a stiff period movie. What Coppola was doing was creating a period drama with a modern flair to make Marie Antoinette, who was very young herself during the events of the film, relatable to audiences young audiences. After all, I was 10 when this movie came out. Was I the target audience? 
I don't know. But that's besides the point. The point is, did I know anything about the French Revolution at 10 years old? No. Could I understand getting a new pair of shoes to make yourself feel better? Yes. <laughs> Especially those shoes. I really wanted a pair of those. <laughs> Funny story about the Converse, in a 2006 interview with IGN, Sofia Coppola said that her brother, Roman Coppola, purposely included the pair of Converse in the scene because he thought it was fun, and they just decided to keep it in after the editing process. And speaking of creative liberties, in an interview with the LA Times, Ken Nero said that uh, women of the 18th century actually wore a lot of lace and jewels to indicate their status, but she decided to scale down both those things for the costumes in this movie. She wanted Kirsten to look really youthful and modern. Rather than lace, they dressed her in organza, tulle, and netting frills and made ruffles in the dresses to make them look softer and fresher. Cannonera said that they did actually borrow a lot of jewelry for this movie, but um, the jewelry looked kind of matronly on Kirsten Dunst because, you know, what teenager in the 2000s is bedecked in heavy jewels? Instead, they wrapped a ribbon around her neck as a signature accessory. So needless to say, this movie is not very historically accurate. Um, I don't want to go through like every single dress and say like what is historically accurate and what isn't just because that would be a huge waste of time. But I will quickly go through some general things that I found in the movie. Marie wears a bunch of different garments. Now, excuse my French. (laughs) She wears a robe a la Francaise, robe a l'anglaise, robe a l'anglaise a la retrousse, peton lier. God, chemise a la reine, possibly a robe a la Turk. The dress that she wore to the masked ball was really modern. This was probably the most modern dress in the movie. The sleeves are totally off for the time. The fabric is super inaccurate. It looks like a silk organza with sequins. The mask is also very simple, which I'm assuming is purposeful so that the audience can read Marie's expressions better. A minor detail I noticed is that Marie also wears a few zone front gowns throughout the movie. This one she wore before Louis XV even died in 1774. When I'm talking about the zone front, by the way, I'm talking about the garment that cuts away like this and it was really popular in the 1780s so Marie in this movie is a little bit early to the trend. The real Marie Antoinette wore a lot of heavy face makeup as well um, especially in the earlier years because it was required under Louis XV's court. But I can understand them not wanting to put Kirsten in a ton of makeup because again Sophia was trying to modernize the film and having Kirsten wear less makeup emphasizes her youthfulness. So again, the reason why I didn't care too much about historical inaccuracies was because I feel like all the inaccuracies were chosen for a reason. They were purposeful and well calculated. Now let's analyze the movie. I would say that the movie's costumes can be broken down into three main parts. The first part being the 1770s, aka her years struggling to produce an heir. The second part being the early 1780s, aka her scaled down cottagecore look. And the third part being the late 1780s, aka her mourning period, leaning up to the escape from Versailles. I just want to make note that the movie timeline is not exactly the real timeline. In the movie, Louis XVI gifts her the Trianon after she gives birth to Maria Therese. But in actuality, Louis XVI gifted her the Trianon around the time that he ascended to the throne in 1774. But narratively, I get it. In the movie, it's supposed to be like a reward for Marie Antoinette after she bears a child. In the first couple of scenes where Marie Antoinette is being transported to France from Austria, there is a very visual transition sequence where she is disrobed and put into new French clothes. This is to represent how her past is literally being stripped away as she's set on a new course. It is a custom that the bride retain nothing belonging to a foreign court, an etiquette always observed on such an occasion. But it also actually happened in real life. Marie Antoinette's mom spent a ton of money on her daughter's trousseau, and when Marie arrived in France, she was wearing a heavy train, voluminous skirts, a ribbon-bedecked bodice, and jewels from her hair to her shoes. But like in the movie, they took away all of her original clothes. And Marie actually had a meltdown when this was all happening. It was just really cold, and she was like stripped naked um, to be changed, and she was only 14. I'd be kind of traumatized too. For her wedding in the movie, Marie wears a robe a la Francaise, which has very nice Watteau pleats in the back and a fitted front. For her actual dress, they used a white-hued cloth of silver, and the whole dress was decorated with uh, white diamonds. So very expensive, obviously. 
But in the movie, they used a champagne colored silk, which is, you know, close enough. <laughs> She's not wearing a lot of jewels, but we already covered why that's the case. An interesting fact about Marie's wedding gown, though, is that it was actually very ill-fitted. Um, the dressmakers cut the bodice a little bit too small, so you could actually see her undergarments um, when she was wearing it, which is a huge yikes. And I wish they added this detail because I feel like not only is it historically accurate, but it also foreshadows Marie Antoinette's unraveling during this new phase of her life. And something else I want to bring up is that Marie Antoinette had to wear a very uncomfortable garment called the Grand Corp, which, according to Nora Wan in her book Corsets and Crinolines, was a bone to court bodice. Noble women would have to wear it only for court, but France's great princesses were expected to wear it on a regular basis. Marie hated this bodice because it was a lot more inflexible than what she was used to wearing in Vienna. The Marquise de la Tour Dupin, who served as a personal attendant to Marie Antoinette, said this about the Grand Corp. It was a specially made corset without shoulder straps laced up in the back, but tight enough so that the lacings four fingers wide on the bottom allowed for a glimpse of the chemise of such fine batiste that it would be readily apparent to everyone if one's skin underneath was not sufficiently white. The front of the corset was laced, as it were, with a row of diamonds. To be fair, it was really freaking tight. Like, she wasn't just being um, spoiled about it. Uh, the Marquise said that it was very exhausting and fatiguing to wear and eliminated a lot of movement, especially around the arms. Marie actually banded it for a time because she hated it so much. And by the summer of 1770, it spread around as political gossip that Marie was not wearing her corset. <laughs> Her mother ended up having to write a letter to her in German telling her that it would look really, really bad if her waistline thickened out and she was not pregnant. So unfortunately, because of the whole lack of baby making, which meant that Marie Antoinette's position was not solidified, um, she ended up going back to the corset. I kind of wish they added this corset drama because it shows how Marie Antoinette was having difficulties acclimating to French royal customs. But I understand there were time constraints for the movie. Moving on. If you notice in the first gossip scenes, the ladies all comment on how Marie looks and what she's wearing. One lady even compares her to a cake. <laughs> I think she's delightful. She looks like a little piece of cake. It'd be interesting to see how long she lasts. I think the whole cake analogy is kind of funny because Marie's whole pop culture legacy is the phrase, Let them eat cake. Which she never actually said, and I'm glad that they said that in the movie. That's such nonsense. I would never say that. But you know, despite that, Marie is definitely dressed kind of like a cake. Of course, the silhouettes of the gowns back then were kind of cake-like in general, but also combined with the confectionery colors and ruffles, she definitely looks like a little sweet thing. And then there's a scene where she's reading a letter from her mother berating her for not producing an heir. Remember, nothing is certain about your place there until an heir is produced. If you notice, Marie is wearing a very similar fabric to the wallpaper, which represents how she's feeding into Versailles, how she's feeling overwhelmed by the expectations people have for her as the future queen. She's basically losing her sense of self to the palace. And then, of course, she has a huge meltdown when Louis XVI's brother's wife gives birth to a child. The I Want Candy scene, aka one of the best scenes in cinematic history, yes, you can fight me on that, is I think kind of like her acting out. She hit that breaking point and now she just wants to have fun. It's kind of like when you fail a test or something in college and you just want to go drink and party. Once again, there's a parallel between cakes and clothing. When we think of the word indulgent, we think of food first usually, or at least I do. So the best way to really emphasize this crazy amount of indulgence is to display food as well. And we see her wear this towering poof in one scene. She's out of control and the movie frames her overspending as a coping mechanism to royal pressures. She's honestly saying like, fuck it, I am the Dauphine. When she finally produces an heir, a huge weight is lifted off her shoulders and the costumes depict that. She starts wearing a white flowing cotton gown called a gall or a chemise à la reine. She wears her hair loose and natural, sometimes decorated with flowers. All of this is to emphasize how comfortable and carefree she is now. I want something more simple, natural. This is all pretty historically accurate. Marie Antoinette popularized the gall, which was initially copied from Creole and colonialist wives who were living in climates too hot to wear silk. It was super unrestricting and worn over flexible cloth bodice. 
Again, the timeline is a little inaccurate. The change Marie makes from these restrictive dresses to the gall is very quick in the movie to represent her pre-baby and post-baby life. But in actuality, it was more of a gradual process. French aristocrats in general were moving towards looser and more comfortable clothing due to Rousseau's writing. Jean-Jacques Rousseau was a French philosopher and he started writing about how luxuries were linked with deplorable socioeconomic inequities. And his influence sparked this trend among aristocrats to dress a tad more modestly. The chemise à la reine wasn't the only dress to come about. There was also the robe à la polonaise. In 1775, Marie and her friends adopted this dress, which eliminated the restrictive paniers and long train associated with the robe à la française. The cut of the overdress was a lot looser, and because the skirt was looped up to reveal the ankles, it was easier to move in. In the final segment of the movie, Marie has to rejoin the court of Versailles to support her husband. She transitions from creamy white colors to very dark colors when her mom and son die. The dresses are once again more restricting, but instead of being bright and pastel like they were in the beginning of the movie, the colors are dusty, faded, and muted to show how Versailles is fading into history. The fabric material also looks heavier to represent the pressure Marie is increasingly under. So overall, as you can see, the most anachronistic aspects of her styling, the color, the fabric of the dresses, the makeup, the hair, these were all done for artistic and narrative purposes. But honestly, even if there was no purpose, like even if there was no reason, I do understand how difficult it is to create like 170 costumes that cover a 20 year time period, especially in the 18th century, because there were so many different kinds of dresses that were coming up into fashion at the time. But it's the fact that the silhouettes were, for the most part, super spot on and the major inaccuracies in the movie, you could totally tell why they chose those things um, that make Marie Antoinette just an unbelievable costume film, in my humble opinion. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.